is what we call hater shit. shit. There is no better term. Let's listen to some Coco episodes. What's going on, you guys? This is the Coco Show podcast. This is Heather Coco Senza. Uh, Xavier's here. We don't know if he's going to weigh in today. This is episode one, week one. I am recording live from the laundromat. Uh, so excuse any background noise that you may hear. This is the first episode of hopefully many. I just want to give you guys some background, uh, personal background, as well as uh, current situation and state of affairs. So my name is Heather, uh, Heather Coco Sanza. Um, Coco Chanel YSL is my performer name and stage name. Um, I do statement modeling. Uh, I have a production company, GoPro Solo. Um, and Xavier and I are working together to create a, a web series that will be similar or inspired uh, by the format of The Daily Show. Just a lot smaller, four to six minute webisodes um, that make difficult to digest information a little easier to take in. Right, with comedy with comedy so um me personally i have three children viviana lewis and alexis uh, alexis is the youngest she is nine years old lewis is the middle he's 15 and viviana is 16 the oldest um, i gave birth to each of my children naturally uh, in the hospital with their fathers uh, we were in relationships at the time of their births i've had three main relationships in my life prior to xavier one was with the father of the two older kids lewis he was Mexican, or is Mexican, so my older kids are Mexican and white. Um, specifically, I'm pretty much a mix of Italian, Irish, Mediterranean, I believe uh, Hispanic because I was in a relationship at 17, 18 years old, living in a home with a Mexican man and his entire family. Um, prior to that, I had been kind of sent around my entire teenage years from 14 to 18 or 17, uh, institutionalized, programmed. So I learned a lot of my core family values and cultural values from a Mexican household. Um, Wait, that's why she thinks she's Hispanic? Lewis and I were together for five or six years. We had two beautiful children, no regrets from the relationship. Uh, we just, you know, we grew in separate ways. Um, then I met Orlando. Both of us were into the fitness lifestyle. Uh, I kind of met him out and about um, unintendedly and just started going on dates with him and started sneaking into his room. He still lived with his mom. We were both in our early 20s. I think I was 24, 25, and he was about 22 or 23 um and we were together for five years uh and then we broke up and i got into a relationship one year later with dylan smith inmate number y12173 that's not a red flag the fact that i have to identify this man with his idoc number or anything um and that was a whole entire saga in itself i was groomed and coerced into sex work uh, survived being raped, held at gunpoint. Um, the stories, horrific as well as enlightening, are uh, thousands in the thousands. You know that I can tell, and I plan on sharing them here uh, in the podcast. So that's a little bit of my background. Uh, it was a tragic ending with Dylan. With the other two, it was kind of just your regular. I hate you. I love you. Are you staying? Are you going? And then ultimately, you know, separation. So. Um, I was the primary custodial parent and uh, influence in all three of the lives of my children from their births through January of 2020 um, when they had to go live with their fathers because I filed for an order of protection against Dylan after being beaten by him, among other abuses um, that I believe were fueled uh, by a deal he had with the state of Illinois. So. We'll get into that you know more and i'm going to uh, create a schedule of topic matter that i'll be releasing on my instagrams and other social media platforms so that if there is a topic you guys are particularly interested in you can tune in at that time um, but that's a little background for me i four years ago or three years ago in january of 2020 was unlawfully thrown out of my home um, after filing for an order of protection against Dylan, my children went to live with their father and I've been living in Airbnbs, uh, traveling, um, and working random jobs and other self-employment endeavors ever since. Um, 
so no stability since that time so that's a big thing for me I really really need that and I'm hoping to get back to that soon uh, sooner than later uh, right so Xavier I met eight months ago um, after a series of abuses that took place subsequent to being unlawfully thrown out of my own home at 2037 West Roscoe, uh, the address that Dylan and I last shared together. The reason I leave a lot of these details in. Did anyone notice that she totally skipped when she stayed in that studio apartment? You were living by yourself because some man helped you get the studio apartment. And then you met Xavier. In our because... Sorry, after she got kicked out, she met Xavier. I am currently uh, attempting to seek some sort of civil rights uh, junction or attention over the matters. And when I say the abuses I suffered subsequent to the unlawful displacement, what I mean is had I never been unlawfully thrown out of my home, a home that I legally inhabited with my children, had mail, you know, coming to, was at for a period of several months, uh, had every right to be in by law, um, I suffered sexual assault and still have uh, several robberies against me. Uh, I was beaten by a man with a tire iron, resulting in the need for five staples or three staples, I'm sorry, to the back of my head at Elmhurst Hospital. Um, and that was just, you know, a couple of examples. I've never been victimized violently before in my entire life. I have no criminal background. So there's a lot of corruption with regards to this story, and I feel as though it 100% needs to be shared publicly. And that's the reason for the podcast. My life has traveled uh, many, many distances and touched on so many different things, um, racial prejudices in the prison system, unlawful and unethical treatment in the prison system, um, exploitation and extortion of immigrants and um, people who fall under a high risk category for exploitation because of secrets or, you know, some sort of uh, status that they hold where, you know, people can take information and hold it over their heads or force them to do things they don't want to do in exchange for not going to law enforcement or the government. Um, on a lighter note, I was groomed into sex work and I dated a whole bunch of really, really interesting personalities. So I will never reveal names. There are celebrities, A and B list, um, but I will never get into it uh, by name, just by story. Um, so we're not just going to be talking about serious shit, um, but also funny stuff. So uh, Xavier is a counterpart who I met about eight months ago. Uh, you have to understand that during these series of abuses, uh, many, many, many people came into my life. I have it all written down. I'm, I'm releasing a novel about this this entire uh, circumstance and story and um, set of environmental, uh, <laughs> I don't even know what to call it anymore. It's it's wild. Um, you guys are really going to have to pay attention. And that's why I'm doing it in episode format, week one, week two, uh, you know, episode one, episode two. I might even do two episodes per week, and they'll be about 10 to 30 minutes each. Um, but Xavier was not a part of my story until about eight months ago. Um, really weird situation with him, um, you know, and how he came into my life. Um, but similar to many others, Again, only in the past four years. Prior to four years ago, you'd never even see me outside. I was at home with my children all the time unless I was getting money. Um, so out to work, back inside, and that was it. I was very active with my kids. I homeschooled my children. I did a lot of projects with my children, uh, fitness activities, outings, the zoo, the parks, the malls. Um, so life changed a lot for me at the pandemic 2019, uh, and it hasn't ever gotten back to normal. Uh, and I can't say that I'm happy about it. I am completely destroyed uh, over not being uh, the primary parent to my children at this moment in time. Um, but like I said, Xavier kind of jumped into my life eight months ago um, under the understanding that, you know, he was going to help me sort out these issues. We haven't made any progress, not for lack of trying, um, but we'll talk. Okay, I'm trying to talk very minimum, okay? Okay, so... 
their relationship was pretty much he understood that he had to help her figure this out. How odd. I mean, I think we all were able to kind of piece together after she had to leave the studio apartment because she was not paying for it and she was threatening to kill people and she was destroying the property. Um, she was on the street for a little bit of time, not too long, and then that's whenever she met him. And we they, like, started smoking together and then it started to lead into more. So, like, how odd is that to... To meet someone and be like, okay, so you're going to help me figure this out, right? That's not a... What is he going to do? Talk about that in the next episode. This was kind of just an intro. Um, and that's it. Uh, Xavier may or may not be in the episodes. There are definitely times when I feel as though his... Uh, his... What sort I'm looking for when you add something to something? His contribution is in an effort to more antagonize, throw off, distract, dilute. So I'm not going to stand for that. Um, stop talking, please. I'm not going to stand for that. What? Dude, did y'all hear her snap at him? Um, it, I'm recording. Please stop talking. And this is what I mean. So Xavier's usual um, influence in my life is not this. Usually he's more of a husband. I can count on him. Uh, he isn't an antagonizer. Every once in a while he turns into like a 13-year-old girl with a vendetta. Um, so if that becomes, you know, a problem, he, he'll have to get off the audio. Um, you know, but there's a lot that's gone on and I'm 100% ready and, and willing to share. So this is episode one. I am Coco Chanel YSL, Heather Coco Senza, Heather Gillespie, reporting live from the laundromat. Talk to you guys later. Reporting live from the laundromat. What's going on, you guys? This is the Coco Show podcast week one, episode two, season one. This is Heather Coco Senza, Coco Chanel YSL. Um, so far, I've just given you guys a brief introduction. Xavier kind of jumped on to say hi. He was in an antagonizing mood, so we moved on quickly. Um, I'd like to get into the episode one, um, which is specifically going to be with regards to sexy content and how I got into um, that line of work. Now, if you guys have never heard of what I'm talking about, I'm talking about platforms like Many Vids, Cam Soda, um, my Vixie, Selfie Pop, um, all of these kinds of um, content trades. From okay, I just want to let y'all know real quick, as of right now, those are not my kids in the background. I don't know if she's still at the laundromat, but I was hearing kids, and I know sometimes if I'm not watching anything crazy, bad, or disturbing, y'all can hear my kids every now and then. Um, this is not my kids. <laughs> Money um, websites. Now, if you're not familiar, let me let me explain how it goes. You build uh, a following. So your following becomes your audience, your client base, your pool of potential um, customers, right? Now, your job becomes um, on these sites, number one, recruiting a following. So much like social media, um, and for anyone who knows me, I have a social media management background as well. But um, when you're doing, when you're growing social media accounts, um, what you're looking for is the use of hashtags, branding, um, and image to tell your story and sell yourself. So much like any small business, you are seeing yourself in your service, whether that's sexy content or whether that's, you know, recipes, whatever it is you're selling, that's your product. You are your own um, product, service, business, small business. So a lot of the rules with small business growth and uh, business con consulting, they apply uh, here when you're talking about uh, creating these websites and, and selling yourself and your message and your content um, 
through the website. And I don't mean selling yourself as in physically. I mean your time, your companionship, your advice, your whatever you decide to sell. So as a performer, when you sign up for these sites, you create a profile, you upload photos and videos and uh, whatever else you'd like. There are uh, things, items that you could sell. You can sell old clothing items. You could sell, um, you know, different accessories that you may have used to create custom pieces. Um, if you get an order, for instance, for a private collection, um, a solo clip of you trying on lingerie, for instance, the person might buy you the lingerie, send it to a P.O. box or wherever, you try it on on video and send it to them and they pay you 100 300 whatever you market and agree on, um, you know, to sell for. You know, and then they send you the the payment, and upon receipt of the payment, you would send them back the content that you created for them. So that's person to person media sales, um, and I, you know I was doing that for quite some time. There's also another portion to that, which is uh, live webcamming. So you have a webcam on, and you could be doing any any one of you know numerous things. Some girls cook, other girls do more adult things. Um, and there are men on there as well and couples. Uh, I always kept it solo and it was just me, you know, doing um, mostly modeling and photo shoots. I made a couple of XXX solo videos where I showed a little more uh, than the bathing suit covers, but not very much. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a, few, a few things probably left floating around in circulation from those days in my life. But like I said, I treated it as a small business and I marketed it as such. So I wasn't in a secretive place creating this. Uh, I felt as though I had nothing to hide and I still feel that way. Um, it was something I tried uh, as an artist. I loved the self-promotion um, and it would work for anyone. And I would love that promotion for anyone. Um, it's the selling of the business, the marketing of the business that I love, the creating of the content that I love, the dressing up, the modeling, the fantasy portion, um, connecting with business is what keeps it real, uh, but also fun. And so you can disconnect from the problems of real life and just live in fantasy and get paid for it, essentially. OK, um, which is why it's so appealing to so many people. On top of that, you can work from home. You never have to leave your house. Right. So there there's a huge appeal to a lot of different people. Um, men and women uh, come in all shapes, sizes, races with all different interests. So you don't even necessarily have to be a fitness chick uh, or have your typical porn star body to be successful. In my experience, what I found mostly was that where I would earn the most money from a single customer or client would be when I was working directly with them via DM or private message. And there was little video photo um, exchange in the, in the beginning. It was more genuinely getting to know these people, uh, maybe not in a prying therapeutic way where you're like coming off as their counselor, but in a loving motherly way. Uh, wifey, um, you know, type of way. People like to feel like there's someone who cares about them. And like if they go missing, someone will notice, right? So <laughs> that was a big thing. When you create those relationships, um, and they are, they do evolve into friendships a lot of time. Um, for safety reasons, my, my exact location and legal name were private at that time when, you know, that was my primary income. Um, but I haven't, I haven't been working in that field since about 2018, 19. Um, at that time, I turned my modeling into statement modeling. My very first statement modeling shoot was a Kanye West inspired piece. Um, if you guys want, I can link it here in the description box and you can go over to Insta. It's also posted on Model Mayhem. Um, it was a super dope shoot, you know, and I like to let my art, um, speak for the way I'm feeling and the way I'm seeing shit in my life and what's going on. But I really don't want to offer too much. It speaks to me, you know, one way, but to you a completely different way. And we're both right, you know, so we're both right with, with each interpretation. So that's about it. Um, my art, it translated from sexy, um, relationship building way to a statement this is important and I feel like it's not getting enough attention type of concept. And that's where I'm at. So GoPro Solo Productions went from being primarily fitness content 
and sexy content to now statement content um, and, you know, important things. And that's the direction for the actual Coco show, the webisode um, series that I created, that I designed, that I thought of four or five years ago um, due to circumstances of being thrown around like a rag doll, haven't been able to really put, you know, a lot of effort into. So um, that's what we're working on now is this podcast as well as this webisode. Um, I think it's important to know that where I started in my background as far as uh, making sexy content as an artist, so many people are concerned with burying it. I mean, if you can if you can go through the colleges and make a list. Hey, babe, can you please start the dryers again? Yeah. Thank you. On hot, please. Um, and kind of like move the blankets around so that the inside, the part that's wet, will like be exposed so it could get dry, please. Thanks. Um, sorry, you guys. We're at the laundry mat still. Uh, what was I saying? I have no idea. Regardless, um, at the end of the day, the point I'm trying to make is I have no secrets uh, at all. <laughs> so I I don't like to keep things hidden. Um, I'm very forward with the kind of art that I worked with in the past. It's not a secret. Um, it was something I did because I was in love with a man who loved Beth and I wanted to make him happy. And in doing so... I found my true passion, which is in production, marketing, creative curation and design, modeling. I would have never found any of those things, marketing, sales. I would have never developed any of those skills. I would have probably never gone to Shaw University for the, you know, a three-month at-home course, consumed thousands of Gary V, you know, uh, content on YouTube. I, I may have never made it that far, you know, had it not been for that brief detour that I took in selling sexy content. So I am grateful for it even though um, it's not something I'm interested in continuing, you know, for my life. And I never got into two-person porn or anything like that. It's always just been me solo and nothing hardcore. Um, Not that I'm judging. But like I said, at the end of the day, I have no secrets. And so many artists, if you go to the colleges and run polls, and they can be anonymous and ask how many people have been on camera doing some sort of sexual something, The numbers are overwhelming. I want to say it's something like 70 or 80 percent. That's seven or eight out of 10 students walking around a college campus today have been on camera doing something sexual. So I'm not embarrassed and, you know, I'm not trying to bury it. I'm, you know, doing the opposite. I want to show it. I want it to be showcased in the evolution of my art. I want people to see where I started and where I, you know, am going and all of the stops I've made along the way. So um, that's kind of that. It just didn't work for me. I thought it was super hot to have a husband who wanted something. And even though I absolutely hated it, to give it a try and step out on that limb for him. Um, There's a podcast where I'm just totally just going in on how sexy it is to do this for your husband and how proud I am to be with him and my hopes and dreams for production when he comes home. Um, I think it was Rashad. I forgot the name of the podcast. I'm going to find it and I'm going to link it. Uh, what, what up Joe, I think was the name of the podcast. And it was a really interesting segment on, uh, voyeurism and cuckolding and all this weird stuff that I was learning about in real time. So when that podcast was recorded, I was in it. You know, I was learning about it just as I was speaking about it. Now we're in 2023, right? So I've already gone through that whole entire psyop or whatever you want to call it and survived it. Yummy. Delicious. Mmm. A little baby at the laundry mat. Um, but I've already survived it and realized that it's not for me. Uh, that doesn't mean it's not for you and it's not for some people. It just isn't for me. Uh, that also doesn't mean I'm embarrassed or ashamed. Does it hurt that I that I was coerced down a path by someone I love that I think ultimately did me a lot of damage overall? Of course it does. Do I blame him entirely? I don't. You know, I was not at a point in my life where I could completely you know, stand on my own two feet emotionally or otherwise. I was a mess, um, you know, and I was in need of love. And I believed that I could trust this person. Um, And whether or not I could is still 
uh, you know, not decided. I most definitely can't in a lot of things, you know, but um, I will never know his true intentions as to whether he steered me in that path for his own financial gain or hopes of making money off of that endeavor or just because it's something he truly loved. You know, and I think that makes all the difference in the world. Intention doesn't matter all the time, but it does a lot of the time, you know. Um, anyways, my art starts evolving into more of a hot topics. Why? Well, because I got to a point where I would go shoot a scene and I would love it. And then I would engage in some sort of cuckolding behavior uh, whether it's him listening over the phone. And for anyone who doesn't know what cuckolding is, and again, I, it's so important that you guys hear this podcast. What up, Joe? I'm going to link it if I can find it, but I go into all of these details as I'm learning them. A cuckold is a man who likes to hear about or learn of his wife being intimate with someone else. So if I would do something like... Dude, this is so disgusting. I'm sorry if anyone's into that, but I am dying over here. Not in, like, a good way, not in laughter. Like, a recording over the phone or whatever, he would be ecstatic about it, so happy. And I'd go look in the mirror and cry for three hours and, like, pound my head into the glass and fill up a bathtub with a cap full of bleach and water and soak in it for two hours. Like, I was not okay. And I'm calling, you know, police, and I'm, and I'm going to the hospital telling them, I want to kill myself. I am yuck. That was the word I used to use all the time. I am yuck. I am yuck. I am yuck. Well, I wasn't yuck. You know, I was in love and dumb and coerced and extremely susceptible to that coercion and exploitation. And I should have been protected. There's there's no other ifs, ands, or buts about it. Every phone call was recorded and I should have been protected. And we'll get into that more later on as well. But um, with regards just basically to the sexy content, it's not something I have done since 2018, 19 time. I'd never tell you to do it or not to do it. It's up to your own personal, you know, uh, life and circumstances I was extremely sexually bashful before I met Dylan um, he's the one who kind of got me into it he is not he is extremely sexually deviant so um, I didn't know most of the things that I know now and what do they say hindsight is 2020 um, but again in an effort to remove myself from the victim mindset I try to just look for any and every lesson I can find in the haystack of victimization. Um, and there are a lot of them, you know, so there are a lot of amazing things I learned. Now, marketing with this kind of a business is the same as any sort of small business. You want to utilize every social media platform possible and then funnel them into your website. Now, if you're selling fucking, uh, my bad for the language, if you're selling sponges, on Amazon or eBay or your own personal website, you want to funnel your clientele to your website or to your eBay or to your Amazon. That's where they're going to click. They're going to make their purchases and you're going to make money, right? So the use of social media, Instagram, uh, YouTube, um, Twitter, Facebook, now it's TikTok, uh, Snapchat. These are vital free tools that you can use to advertise yourself, your service, your business, whatever it is, by sending marketing materials to the people who you network with on these social media platforms, you're essentially funneling them to whatever your business or service is and hopefully converting them to customers, clients. So that's always been the point. Now, when selling sexy content is no different. When I go out and I go to an event and there are a thousand people at the event, if I can get a hundred of them to click on my webpage, that's 10%. I'm doing something right. So when I say I would only leave the house to make money, that's what I mean. I mean, I would be with my children all week long, all day finish their homework, feed them dinner, shower them, get them ready for bed, send them off to their fathers on a Thursday night, okay? Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I would spend all day and night, sometimes not even sleeping, networking, making sales, creating content, doing photo shoots, curating photo shoots, planning, wardrobing, styling. I did everything myself, one man show. So I had an assistant, a booking assistant who would help me with spaces, travel, uh, reservations, et cetera, and so forth, who eventually evolved into also sort of a nanny for me. Um, 
but everything other than that was pretty much alone, you know, myself. And my last assistant out of all of them had a strong production background, thank God, uh, because I really needed assistance at that time. All my, all of my content was great and my marketing was going well, but it was just blowing up too fast. It was too much for one person. My in-person business, as well as my online businesses, were too much for one person. You know, on top of that, I was managing a relationship with someone in prison, eight hours away, driving to visit him every single month. And then his last year, he was moved to Stateville uh, in Joliet, Illinois. And I went to see him every single Saturday and Sunday. So while the kids are with their dad. So I really, really took that four or five year uh, period and made it 100% about accelerating in business. And I think I did. So that is another reason why the situation I'm currently sitting in is so questionable and curious and doesn't make sense. Um, now, if you're wondering, if you haven't been following or you haven't been able to visit the FTR sections of my social media so you don't really know... Uh, what we're talking about with my situation. I have been being ignored by law enforcement. I have been obstructed. Uh, justice has been obstructed numerous times that I've called 911 for assistance. I'm under the impression at this point the United States must be under some sort of attack um, and that our government is completely infiltrated because, as I said before, um, Dylan was on parole holding guns and drugs and beating me. Dude, she was actually doing all right. She was going on about 10 maybe 15 minutes of her not bringing up the same old thing repetitively here we go again severely and i went for orders of protection and they were denied and then they were granting him orders of protection and ultimately threw me out of my home and into the street since i've been 17 or 18 years old i've had my own residence uh i'm I tell everyone I'm 29, so if anyone asks, I'm 29 because I'm part of the Infinity Club, uh, where I have sponsors who are committed to my Botox uh, donation every month, uh, not every month, every six months, so that I never age past 20. Who the hell is that? 29 physically, uh, but in real time, I'm 36 years old, and, uh, you know, I'm since 17, I've been holding my own keeping a roof over my head, uh, supporting myself and my children. I put myself through college, uh, you know, with three children. I worked at Northwestern, a very prestigious hospital for six or seven years. I have numerous letters of recommendation from physicians, from, you know, bankers, from um, restauranteurs, um, from uh, private home care companionship for diabetic patients or other patients. I have, I have many, many letters of recommendation highlighting my experience, um, you know, and the things that I've gone through and what I've been successful at. Um, so there's just a plethora of experience that I have. There is no job I haven't done, nor is there a job I can't do well. So when you talk about being stable from the, the age of 17 through the age of 30, uh, what was I, 33 when he came home? But she can't go get a job. Or she will not go get a job. <laughs> so she's not working. Um, and then you look, I was violently thrown into the street, raped, beaten, robbed. My medication robbed from me. Pants ripped off my body while I sleep. Big, heavy men laying on me and sexually assaulting me. Calling law enforcement every time and having in writing online police reports that I submitted and getting to the numbers of 20 and 30 reports being made for each of those occurrences and still to this day in 2023 zero follow-up i've contacted every news and media outlet nbc cbs uh abc cnn wgn um this isn't a joke you know, I have been separated from my children and family who I was the primary parent and pri head of household. I am worried, you know, and I have been dragged through shit. So this podcast is about way more than just the things that are affecting you guys. This shit's affecting me too, you know, um, in a very real way. I've petitioned at the Daily Center as well as other area courts in Cook County, including Arlington Heights, for a court date five or six times in person on video. And I posted that to my Insta as well as my YouTube. Um, and they refuse to give me a court date. So they're essentially holding me hostage away from my children and family, giving me zero response and violating all of my rights, constitutional rights, human rights and civil rights. They didn't buy me a tent. I'm not sleeping in a tent because they helped me get one. They threw me out in the street to die and robbed me of every clothing item I had, all my pants, all my shirts, underwear, literally everything. 
They left me in the street with nothing other than the clothes on my body and stole everything else from me. And I'm coming from a five bedroom, fully furnished home. Okay, with clothing for myself, my children, toys, electronics, furniture, and not a ghetto, you know, piece of shit home, a nice home furnished with thousands and tons of thousands of dollars worth of shit, a nice home. I always kept a nice home. So where is the where is the intervention here and civil rights? Well, here's just three examples. I've called the police a million times. I submitted a sheet that was covered in bodily fluids indicating sexual assault, sedation, and sexual assault. Hi. I submitted that to law enforcement. I told them that I felt sedated. Okay, because you were on Duster. Sorry. This was never she was in that studio apartment, and she was doing Duster quite a bit. And nobody was in there, unless you invited them in there. It wasn't this person who stole your damn makeup or your vacuum cleaner either. And that when I woke up, my pants were ripped from my body and that there were sheets covered in body stain, body fluid stains. They took the sheet and said, quote, maybe you should make a doctor's appointment. You don't seem like your mental health is in check. And I recorded it and it's live on my Instagram. So I'm, I'm reporting rape. And the first time I reported being raped, I was taken into custody, had to bond out. And the second time I report rape, they laugh in my face and tell me to make a doctor's appointment. And you mean to tell me there's nothing wrong? Our government is not under attack. Well, make make it make sense. Make it make sense then. So I have copies of all the police reports. I really encourage you, if you guys are new here, please check out my Instagram. I have everything posted there, all the proof. Um, if you know any lawyers who can help me out, I'm extremely eager. I've been living in an Airbnb for the majority of the past four months. I met Xavier eight months ago who said that he was sent, quote, by God to assist me in oh. finding solutions to these ongoing concerns. And since that time, nothing has changed. I supported us and put us in Airbnbs for four or five months while I was pregnant because, oh, yeah, <laughs> he news after three years of being celibate. So besides the rapes, I never had sex with anyone while all of this abuse was occurring. Anyone. Dylan was my last relationship. We broke up in January of 2020. I was removed from the home, our home that we shared together, and I didn't voluntarily have sex with a single person since then until I met Xavier. So three years of celibacy. Then Xavier has sex with me for eight hours. What? Eight hours. Neither him nor I have recollection. What? Neither one of them have any recollection, but they did it for eight hours? Bro, tell me y'all get high without telling me y'all get high. Of the details. I woke up five or six times during it. The rest of the time I was unconscious. He says he didn't give me anything to sedate me. I know I didn't take anything voluntarily to sedate me. And he speaks on this. We've got recorded audio on Snapchat, on many other platforms. He says, yeah, you're not lying. That happened. No explanation. And I end up getting pregnant with twins. Dude, okay, I'm sorry, but... He goes, I really honestly believe he goes along with her because he's scared of her. If, if, if he says the wrong thing or doesn't agree, oh, shit's gonna hit the fan. I'm crying because I can't get to my own children that I love and, and need and care more about than the entire universe. And I end up pregnant with twins homeless by the, and, and with Xavier. It's, you guys have no idea. So I'm looking forward to getting there, but I want to get there in real time. Right now, we're still all the way back in 2019 um, at the point of when law enforcement unlawfully threw me out of my own home after calling the police on Dylan Smith, inmate number Y12173 in the IDOC for being on parole, having guns and drugs, and beating the fuck out of me. And by beating the fuck, I mean stomping on my head, picking me up by my throat and choking me, locking me outside the alley in my underwear, among other things. So um, I love you guys. Thank you for tuning in. This is the first real episode of the podcast, The Coco Show, Heather Coco Senza. I'm looking forward to picking up where we left off, um, doing two episodes per week for now. Um, so I, I will probably be posting another one a week from today. But if you're listening to this on a podcast, it won't matter. Real time won't matter. Um, so they'll probably all be up around the same time. I love you guys. Thank you so much for your support and, and for tuning in. Um, I'm super eager to continue 
you know, shedding light on all of these abuses uh, and more. All right, let me look at this real quick. Oh, oh gosh. <sighs> these are some comments. Girl, you're yelling about, uh, I don't really like saying that word, cuckolding, SA, etc. at the freaking laundromat near a child have, yeah. I was wondering that too. I was like, surely nobody can hear her talking about this. Um, don't call yourself a mother. Mothers do whatever it takes to better themselves for their children. Get on psych meds and stop pretending to be a model. A fake production company that solely focuses on you and your obsession with Dylan. A guy who wants nothing to do with you. You are an embarrassment to everyone who knows you. <sighs> okay, here's another comment from the same person. You will be a 70-year-old woman walking the streets with no front tooth, still crying about Dylan. He was the hottest guy. He's not hot, though. I'm not going to read that. And then someone wrote, here's to bigger and better. Well, hello. Hi, guys. Coco, the Coco Show. Here with Xavier, uh, we're going to shoot episode three, podcast episode three, season one. Okay, the sound is totally different, so I don't know why. Hopefully it'll get fixed because my head's hurting. That's three episodes in the first week of launching. Good for us. I am patting myself, Heather Coco Senza, right on the back. <laughs> it's been a rough couple of years, you guys, for this elephant we are birthing at GoPro Solo. We have the podcast. We have the webisodes, uh, among other things. We have the modeling. We have, and again, it's statement modeling, fashion modeling, athletic modeling, um, and then we have all of the just regular stuff that we're doing, everything and anything. We've got art. Um, we've got painting, uh, big mural size art going on in the community, uh, as well as art shows. And uh, today, actually, we stumbled across uh, a possible collaboration for a fashion show. Um, so that was super exciting, unintentional. But anyways, we're going to pick up where we left off uh, after episode two. I was briefly touching on cuckolding. Oh uh, no. <laughs> just to keep it controversial right in the beginning of the episode. For anyone who doesn't know, babe, do you know what that is? Okay, for anyone who doesn't know, it's when your significant oh other or whoever uh, likes to watch or hear you engaging in intimate interaction uh it's a turn on for them um they love it right that's what my relationship was with was like uh previous to this one with xavier um so i didn't get into any sort of camming or sexy lingerie modeling or fitness modeling because i thought it would be fun i went there because my husband dylan smith uh I'm not going to keep saying his name every episode, but I don't want anyone to get confused with Orlando or Lewis. Uh, he wanted that, and he asked for that consistently. And I go into great detail on the podcast, What Up Joe, to discuss how I thought it was hot. I thought it was what your partner wants. You know, maybe it isn't for you and you realize that, but when you're truly in love, from my perspective, and you guys know I value monogamous relationships, um, and my gender is female and my um i mean my gender identification is female and i also identify as heterosexual although i do find women attractive mm. i'll flirt with a woman but nothing serious i you know messed around with a woman in the past when i was a teenager uh it's just not really my, my jam um babe it sounds like what you're talking about is the opposite you have to speak into the mic babe like what you're talking about is the opposite exactly and so I cried, you know, when he asked for it. It is the opposite of not giving me. I cried and cried and cried, and I said no. For a good six months, I said no. Um, until I finally, you know, my brainwashed myself into that little saying that if I love him and he's my husband, I'll give him whatever he wants, you know, even if it hurts me. 
Um, so ultimately it wasn't, you know, the best for me, uh, at all. It did a lot of weird stuff to my mind. I, I didn't you like it. Didn't care about you. Of course I did, you know, and I, yeah, you know, of course I did, but the verbal commitment to making me feel secure in what I was doing was so on point and so like to a T there when I needed it, like to get me to say yes. You know what I'm saying? Like if, if someone caught me like asking me to do something like that, you know, when I was on my A game emotionally, of course, you know, it would have been a no brainer. But when you add in the loyalty that I have to my quote unquote husband and the, the commitment between a husband and wife is so rare nowadays. I think it's so attractive. I think to find someone who can look at a sea of the opposite sex or whatever sex they're interested in and want nothing more is really sexy. Um, and there aren't a lot of people who feel that way um, anymore. And at the end, he was very insistent that he agreed and that my desires for monogamy were mutual. Right. He stopped talking to five or six women, the girl from Love After Lockup, um, the one that he discussed in the show. She was never on the show, but um, that's one of the ones that actually he stopped talking to to be monogamous with me. So when he asked for that, yeah, you know, it was painful um, and it did cause me a tremendous amount of pain afterwards, during and in the middle. But uh, I don't regret it, you know, and I wish I would have just been stronger, um, you yeah, know, but we're not victim shaming here. You don't think we should speak on the brainwashing? The brainwashing. Well, it's all part of one. It's And it's all a part of perspective. If intention is unclear, it's very difficult to label something as, well, 100% was brainwashing. But was it intentional brainwashing? Or was it just, I like this, I want you to like it too? So I'm going to try to be persuasive, brainwashing. Or, you know what I'm saying? Or at that point, you could have been, was he working with a team of cops? Was he working with a team of cops? And my suspicion is yes. <laughs> Look at Xavier. <laughs> no, he didn't. Or was he working with a team of cops? Which is why I always say all these calls have been recorded since the very beginning. There's a lot of liability on the line. Um you know, someone needs to provide information that we're lacking, oh, that you know, and, and that we're unclear about. So that information is out there in collections. That he was working with police early on. So you're still under the belief system that it's all corrupt and that everyone knew except for me. Uh, look, she's getting irritated because she's like, no, that's not what happened. <laughs> what, could you imagine being around these two and they're both just outlandish and just crazy? It's like they're just that bored. I mean, it's all been like a whirlwind. It's been super surreal. Um, I literally feel some days like kim kardashian in the middle of a smear campaign like get off of my back you know what i mean sometimes and it's we're almost four years later neither does such an influx of commentary still coming in four years later is why you know i finally made the decision that i'm gonna start speaking on some of this shit um and let's make it fun so that's my background uh i worked at northwestern hospital in uh, healthcare. For six or seven years, I worked at Gottlieb Hospital. I worked at um, Alexian Brothers Hospital. I've worked every job since I was 14 years old, from pizza places to factories to retail stores. Um, I have tons of relevant experience um, for small business and marketing from what I learned in selling sexy content. We kind of touched on that in episode two. Uh, speaking of which, shameless plug, if you guys need copywriting, marketing, um, strategy, logistics, anything like that, hit me up. Um, the DM is open and that's really my jam. Like I, I rock and roll at that. I'm phenomenal at creating campaigns, 
phenomenal at running campaigns and phenomenal at thinking of ideas uh, for brands that have never been thought of before. Um, so, like I said, email me, hit me up. Um, we're always open to that. But now, let's just, moving forward, go under the assumption that we cannot say whether or not his intentions were good or bad. Okay, and let's just move it forward. So I think this is very important to note because when you're talking about a woman who's working in sexy entertainment, you have kind of categories. A single woman who does it herself and, you know, isn't in a relationship or anything. Married women whose husbands mostly also are involved in doing it. Stop, Xavier, stop. You guys remember how I was telling you Xavier's been being incredibly antagonistic lately and I might not be able to put him on the podcast. Oh my gosh. Dude, I feel so bad for him. What's so sad? <sighs> I'm not trying to be rude or mean. It, I mean, you can't blame me for me wondering. But I wonder if he's just done so many drugs. Because that does obviously happen. Um, where... You know, like, did he do so many drugs and that's why he's like this? Or is he, like, on the spectrum? Does he have a disability? Because he was just... I'm not, I'm not going to say he was just fine because he was saying some crazy stuff. But now she's yelling at him. Like, is is he just bored so he's acting out? I don't know. But I can't stand it whenever she yells at him like that. You would think... I mean, I mean I guess... I mean, he's a grown-ass man. But it's just sad if he did have a disability. Um, I, I wish someone in his family could save him from her. Cast. Well, tonight he's having some issues, so just bear with I, us. I, I just know about microphone placement and omnidirectional microphone placement. Okay. And okay. So Anyways, what was I saying right now when you interrupted me to move the mic? That you. I was not saying anything about that. <laughs> so, all right, you guys, I'm 100% going to upload this just so that you can get a little background. But I want you to know that uh, this is another sabotage attempt that I'm not really feeling. Um, I've been working on this podcast for five years. Anytime I involve a second person, they do things like that. So this is out of Xavier's character. He doesn't usually act like that. This is five years going on that I've been attempting to get these podcasts out. And every single time I involve a second person... This is what goes on. So I am posting this. I want you guys to hear what goes on. It's a perfect example. Um, okay. But yeah, now that we have the background out of the way, um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna end there. Uh, but I do want this to be episode three. I want you guys to see what I've been dealing with. Like this is not my first attempt, second attempt, third attempt, hundredth attempt. This is like legit my three or four hundredth attempt uh, to get this podcast together. And you can tell by my voice, my demeanor. Um, and how I carry myself that I'm clearly not the issue here. So, this is the Coco show. Oh, she's clearly not the issue. No, and this is episode three, season one, and I look forward to coming uh, back here with you guys without Xavier, I think, oh. um, or when he's in a different place to continue talking about this. Uh, but that's the background, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Okay, um, we'll talk to you guys soon. When you're okay, a couple of comments. The audio is really bad and echoey. Can barely hear Xavier. Why can't Xavier speak? Let him say what he thinks. He sure seems innocent to me. All he is. I'm. I think it. It's supposed to say all he is doing is talking, and you. All right, you guys, so sorry. This is going to be episode 3.5. It's actually episode 4, but again, we're just going to do a little episode 3.5 so I could clarify uh, now that I have my attention refocused. This is the Coco Show, Heather Coco Senza, coming to you live from Whole Foods Market, where I am charging a my motherfucking phone. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what we were talking about. Um, my relationship was with a man who was communicating to me that if I loved him, I would do X, Y, and Z sexually. 
Now, setting boundaries is something that we talk about as women, as young men, um, as older women, as older men. We should be in relationships where we feel comfortable saying, no, I don't like this. Yes, I do like this. No, this is not okay. Yes, this is okay. Right? That's called setting boundaries. When you set your boundaries firmly over and over again, and they're just trampled upon, and you have to look to someone external, a third party, to help you keep your boundaries intact, that's when we kind of start to teeter-totter on the line of predatory, okay? And that's my opinion. So everything I've been through, um, the sexual abuse that happened you know, as a result of what I was involved in with the webcamming and the sexy entertainment, um, along with the actual income earning part of that, None of that would have happened, um, you know, had I not met Dylan and had we not been in a relationship and had I not been so eager to make him happy. Um, as his wife, I wanted my husband to be happy. Even if it seemed like I was doing something weird, I was, like I said, at least willing to try everything once. And if I don't like it, I don't like it. When he came home and you actually practically apply that to the world, it doesn't work like that, you know? everything was ruined. I, I saw him do something and I'm not going to get into details, but it's like, this is a man who I felt and still feel I know like the back of my hand. After I saw him do that, my whole heart and soul were broken. I felt as though I would never love him the same way. I felt as though he was giving something that literally belongs to me to someone else. Like the last $5 in my wallet or my home or like that's how it felt not like he's a possession but like something that him and I only share he was just passing out to whoever you know what I'm saying it, it was just I literally just started bawling like right there in the bedroom like all three of us just caught crying so um it, it didn't go you know very well and I'm not you know saying that that's his fault or the other person's fault or my fault I am just saying um it wasn't for me right? So moving on, um, it's just important to understand that all the things that I've gone through, they were subsequent to that relationship and would have never happened had it not been for that relationship. So I have a lot to be grateful for, even even in the ruin, uh, you know, and the destruction caused by that relationship uh, and a lot of experience, um, you know, to, to be grateful for. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I just wanted to bring up that when you're talking about women selling time for money, consultations, whether they're business, whether they're fitness, whether they're yoga instructors, whether they're whatever they are, you find a huge demographic of angry men who are just pissed off that she is charging money. It doesn't matter what it's for. They're just angry about it. And they are just oh too eager to voice that concern and that, that hatred. So I was working in a field that is not, you know, the easiest to deal with your own mental health in, to stay on your own two feet, to keep your boundaries intact. Um, there are a lot of people in many industries, but in that industry specifically, who don't take no for an answer. Just like you find a salesperson who is not going to take no for an answer, you express interest in a pair of shoes, they're going to sell you those shoes. It was the same kind of a situation, you know, and understanding that it, it's understanding everything. It changes every single thing about who I am, the way I'm perceived and where my future can go from here. So, you know, this is absolutely pertinent information. Um, you, when you ask yourself, oh, is this a woman working in sexy entertainment and disrespecting her husband? Or is this a woman who didn't want to work in sexy entertainment, but her husband wanted her to, and then she decided to do so for him. Do you see how different that changes everything that happens after what happened? Do you see what I'm saying? You guys see what I'm saying. So I just wanted, you know, this first season to be about getting to know me and my background so that we can talk about these deeper issues. It was actually in a visit with Dylan. Uh, I didn't know much about his professional background of you know, drug sales or whatever else he had gone down for, kidnapping, whatever else. Um, he told me some story that was easy for me to buy. It made sense. Um, and, uh, you know, I believed in him and I believed in his story. And I also didn't want to believe that all those other girls, the Marissas, the Jordans, the, all these other women, you know, uh, were telling the truth about him. You know, I wanted to believe him. So 
I, I can't really say um, that I was aware of it, but I had an idea that he had a criminal background. And when he accepted that time, I was sitting with his mom and his grandma in the pew, I think it's called, at the courtroom. I, you know, I went to support them. And I was very much involved in that criminal proceeding. I had no knowledge of his crime, you know, or whether or not he was guilty. I wasn't there. I had nothing to do with it. Uh, but I was, you know, very much involved with negotiations between his lawyer and the state of Illinois. Um, so that's why I say husband when I talk about him. We had a prenuptial agreement in hand that his mother paid thousands of dollars for an attorney to draw up. I still have a copy of. Um, so when we filmed the reality show and he had this subplot, this hidden agenda to cheat on me with a girl who had robbed my house allegedly and had sex with my other boyfriend, the boyfriend I had before I met Dylan. Um, I think they really, you know, fueled that fire uh, with him. I think they thought it would be great. Oh, you know, this girl, Heather hates. Let's have Dylan cheat on her with the same girl that her previous boyfriend did. And I think that's pretty much what happened. So they pinned me against this other girl and then humiliated me, you know. And uh, the following four months, I'm sorry, four years, uh, little did I know at the time, would be filled with nonstop, pretty much, uh, you know, terror. My vehicle being destroyed, my home being taken from me, uh, my children who I've raised their entire lives as the primary custodial parents separated uh, from each other and myself. You know, I raised them as siblings with me four or five days a week, and now all of a sudden they're living with their fathers uh, and separated. So they, they, Dylan got out and they rocked my world. You know, they, they blew my world to smithereens, uh, and I'm still trying to pick up the pieces. But Gold Pro Solo has been my project since before my world fell apart. So Gold Pro Solo is that one part of my life that they couldn't get to. That one part of my life that makes me able to say, I didn't dream it all up. I am telling the truth. This is real, right? So this is 100% a passion project for me. Um, where else can you go and just talk shit and have no one, you know, interrupt you, right? Where else can you go and say this is wrong or this is right? Oh my gosh. I, w I mean, I think we all know Heather has blamed Dylan, but for some reason it just hit me again like if your life was almost perfect none of this crazy stuff has ever happened until you met Dylan why are you letting that dude hold so much power in your life like I just wish she would realize that you know like I wish that light bulb would go off and her realize I'm not going to let him control my life anymore, you know, do whatever you need to do to, you know, reconcile or just with yourself, with the past, not, Lord, do not try to reach out to him, but just let bygones be bygones. I mean, forgive and forget, you know, just remember you know don't don't be stupid don't let nothing like that happen again but don't let it run your life it's crazy because if you think about it you're like I mean if he ruined your life in so many ways for so long you know just explore conversation and uh thoughts and opinions about subjects uh like a podcast it's the perfect setting so um, that's that. That's the background. The next thing is the racism systemically that I encountered in that relationship. I had never been with someone in prison before. So going and visiting him in there was awful. I mean, it was very, very scary. Um, just everything from being pat down to, you know, having your belongings gone through to being really disrespected by a lot of the staff there who I later found out, you know, had some sort of sub agenda as well. Um, with Dylan, but just a very uncomfortable period. You know, there was nothing about those days that it was like, oh my God, this is so fun. I get to go sit in a prison waiting room all day long, my entire Saturday and Sunday, you know, woohoo. 
like it's misrepresented. I love the man and I would have done anything for him, you know, to go visit him. But there was a million things I could have been doing, like getting some rest, you know, um, and not being terrified. So this was when I really first began to develop an interest in what was going on regarding uh, civil rights, civil rights for our generation, oh civil rights for our generation who has been silenced specifically. And yesterday we spoke on it a little bit. Um, I don't know if I spoke on it here in a podcast or if it was in conversation, but a big portion of that demographic are sex workers or former sex workers, uh, gay or queer or trans or all of those other identifying words, communities, um, communities who feel oppressed, whether that's by race, whether that's by social, you know, socioeconomic status, whether that's by, you know, random targeting, whatever. So, uh, there really, there really is no format. And I think that's okay. Um, with regards to the systemic racism, I'll tell you guys a little story and then I'm going to, I'm going to close for this episode, uh, this podcast episode, cause we already have a three. This is just a 3.5. Remember but I remember the very first time I went to visit him, he was in Vienna, Illinois, eight hours south of Chicago. Uh, it was his mother and I, his mother Paula and I, uh, Heather. We drove down there at eight hours. We got a hotel. His mother and I were very close. I, I was her kind of right-hand man for being her support person uh, when she would be experiencing emotions she didn't want to give to her her, hus- her hubby, a man um, what? who, you know probably might not be able to understand uh, like another woman, another mother could or would. Um, and we got down there and one of the very first stories he told us, I was so shocked and uncomfortable. I think it quite possibly contributed to the PTSD uh, fit that I had on the way back. Um, and it was, he, Dylan said, mom, babe, you're never going to guess what they said when, when I got in. And his mom's all eager. what they say? what they say? You know, and me too. Can't wait to hear it. And he's got a big smile on his, on his face. The guy checking me in says, pulls me to the side and says, yo, there's a huge mistake on your intake form. You're never going to believe this. And Dylan is biracial. He, his mother is white. His father is black. Um, so he's black and white. And he says to the, to the security guard, or to the, uh, what are those things called in prison, the guards in prison called? Uh, See us. Prison guard? No. There's a word for them. Whatever. The correctional officer. He says, so what? what is it? The guy says, they marked you on your intake form as being African American. Can you believe that? And, but he said it like in a real racist mean way. And he goes, I'll fix it right now and write that, you know, that you're white. And Dylan started laughing and just went along with it. And I swear to God to you guys, I had never understood that there was still systemic racism. I had never understood there was still racism at all. I mean, I guess if we had a conversation and stopped and talked about it intelligently, I would know that somewhere in the world it exists. But to encounter it like that and to see this man who was already fully trained in what his response should be, because believe he knew that if he told that CO that he was black, he was at the very least fearful that it, if telling the CEO he was black and that it wasn't a mistake, he would be treated differently. And that really opened my eyes that there still are generation, you know, generational things and older generations and just people in general out there who don't really get it yet, you know? And so that was my first, you know, big lesson. And like I said, that was the very first time we went down to visit. Um, it was eye opening and, um, you know, there were tons of other little stories like that that I will share with you guys. But the relationship was, you know, that every single thing, you know, every impactful lesson out of life was that racist, racist uh, systems. Never heard of it, never considered it prior to that relationship. Never. So, you know, yeah, uh, I don't mind if he spontaneously combusts. I take it back. Just kidding. Uh, but there were there were a lot of things that I feel compelled to speak about uh, as a result of that relationship, and that's one of them. Um, I think that with the pandemic, with COVID, with everything that took place in 2019 outside of you know my own personal attack, um, we are making big waves 
just by being more aware. Um, I think there was a huge lack of awareness that social media is helping bridge the gap with. But just even more so, a lot of attention and awareness during that time, it opened a lot of people's eyes. Um, so yeah, that's episode 3.5, you guys. I'll talk to you later. Don't worry, we're getting better and better. I'm going to structure these episodes, webisodes, podcasts uh, more so that I can give you guys a preview of the subject matter. But um, feel free to DM me or email me or comment with me. I have a blog, mercifulstorm.com. It's coming back up in the next week so we can share thoughts there. And I'm going to be writing uh, in more detail about some of the subjects that I cover here on the podcast. So check that out. I'll talk to you guys later. Happy Sunday. Uh, this is Heather Coco said about the Coco Show. Okay, someone said, Dylan said on a live that he did for a content creator that you were his ride or die. That you stood with him when he had nobody. I believe you when you talk about the abuse he put you through. May I ask how you how you met Dylan? I was just wondering. And Heather said.